Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce our third year resident, Fabian Kalt. Uh, he's uh, doing a residency training in our department, currently interested uh, for visceral surgery. Uh, he will talk about uh, Clostridium difficile colitis today. The presentation uh, was mentored by Silvia Brugger from Department of Infection Disease. We thank him uh, for his mentoring and he will lead discussion later. Please enjoy the talk. Thank you. Welcome to this Tuesday's resident lecture. Um, thank you, Dima, for the nice introduction and the mentoring during this presentation. As already mentioned, today's talk will be about Clostridium difficile infection. I will first give you a very short overview about the epidemiology and a small glimpse at the microbiology of Clostridium difficile infection. Then we will see how C. difficile can affect our intestine, which is followed by the diagnostic workup in a suspected CDI infection. And then we will talk about the treatment. And in the end, I want to give you an idea about preventive measures. And of course, there will be a take home message. Clostridium difficile is an anaerobic bacillus, which forms spores and produces two toxins, A and B, what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. The um, Clostridium difficile is the primary cause of antibiotic associated infection. And epidemiological studies found a carry rate about um, 3% in young, healthy adults, compared to about 10% in in-hospitalized patients. This is important as um, even on asymptomatic patients serve or asymptomatic people serve as a reservoir and can be therefore the source of an infection. Ways of infection are the ingestion of spores or a growth advantage of Clostridium difficile, for example, in the use of antibiotics. Studies found the incidence of in-hospital infection to be around 73 in 100,000. One quarter of patients shows a recurrence within them 30 days of infection. There are several identified risk factors can someone help me out here? So as you mentioned before, um, usually we see those kind of infections uh, in older pa patients who um, have been staying in the hospital over a longer period of time and uh, receiving broad spectrum antibiotics. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Especially risky antibiotics are fluoroquinolones, clindamycin, cephalosporins, and broad-spectrum penicillins. Clostridium difficile is usually not invasive, and there are also strains which don't produce toxins at all. There are two types of toxins, A and B, whereby toxin B is around 10 times more virulent than toxin A. The toxins disrupt the tight junctions of the mucosa, Inter interact and inactivate intracellular pathways and generate mucosal inflammation. These all together lead to mucosal damage and ulcers formation, fluid secretion and diarrhea. And CDI is quite a bigger problem in North America as they have more severe disease and a higher mortality and especially they got more community acquired Clostridium difficile infection. Something we only seldom in, uh, in Switzerland. And this is attributable to a so-called hypervalent strain, O27, which produces a binary toxin. So we all associate Clostridium difficile with diarrhea, but not every patient with diarrhea has the same probability to have a Clostridium difficile infection. Suspicion should be raised if a patient has three or more loose stools within 24 hours, which should prompt entailed testing for CDI. And then Clostridium difficile infection is graded in, in three grades of severity. A patient with diarrhea and lower abdominal pain, nausea and a low grade fever has a non-severe disease. These symptoms together with hypervolemia, lactate acidosis, elevated creatinine and or leukocytosis build the section of a severe disease. Patients 
with fulminant disease usually present in shock with ileus or megacolon. Thereby has to be mentioned that megacolon is not exclusively seen in CDI as it is defined as non-obstructive colonic dilatation together with a systemic toxicity. Around 4.3% of patients with Clostridium infection will develop megacolon. So this is probably one of the most important and helpful slides in this presentation and it shows the diagnostic workup in a suspected CDI. First of all, you need to collect the stool sample of the patients if you suspect a CDI. Then you test for GDH, which is an enzyme produced by toxigenic and non-toxigenic strains. And as we heard before, only the toxigenic strains can cause CDI, so you have to test for the toxin in itself via immunoassay. And then if you got an indeterminate result, the two middle boxes, um, of the four, we test via uh, PCR to clarify the result and then we end up in one of the two boxes at the bottom. Now if we have confirmed the CDI infection, we have to treat it and in this table I summarize the treatment algorithm according to our hospital guidelines here at the US set. In the treatment of Clostridium difficile infection, it is very important to distinguish between the first episode and the recurrent episode and uh, between the different grades of severity we heard before. A first episode of non-severe disease is either treated with oral metronidazole or oral vancomycin. A severe disease of a first episode of severe disease is directly treated with oral vancomycin and in second line you can consider oral phydoxamycin. Fulminant diseases are treated with oral vancomycin in combination with intravenous metronidazole and intravenous because of a certain delay of vancomycin to get to the colon where it has to act. Metronidazole is um, secreted bilary and into the, the colon, so it, work, it acts faster there. Patients with ileus, <clears throat> you can consider rectal vancomycin. And also what I forgot to mention before, if a patient has an ileus and can, you cannot collect the stool sample, a rectal swab is also possible for the diagnosis, which also shows a high sensitivity. Then the treatment of recurrence, there is no role for metronidazole. We directly treat with vancomycin. Patients with risk factors, again, can be considered to give um, phydoxamycin. Fecal transplantation is only an option in patients with risk factor and several recurrent episodes of CDI. There is also an other option which is very expensive and quite new. It's a humanized uh, antibody against toxi toxin B, bezalutuximab. So there was a British meta-analysis analysis published 2018 in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, and they looked into the different antibiotic treatments of CDI. They included 24 trials with over 5,300 patients, and they concluded that phydoxamycin is superior to vancomycin. And they also said that metronidazole should not be recommended as a treatment option in CDI. So they, there is a bit uh, a conflict, but since this, the, guide, the different guidelines of the treatment of CDI have not been adapted yet. So we will see what happens in this section. Besides antibiotic treatment, there is also a role for surgery. Some studies state that around 30% of the patients with CDI will need surgery within the course of the disease. But usually surgery steps in when antibiotic treatment fails or the patient is in imminent shock. So indications for surgery are of course colonic perforation or um, ischemia end organ failure, abdominal compartment, and peritonism. So there is a proposed treatment algorithm in surgery, 
First, you have to check for abdominal compartment. If there is one, you go directly for exploratory laparotomy and colectomy. It is important to say that segmental resection of the affected parts in the colon is not recommended. And there is another way, a bit less radical, published by a group from Pittsburgh and presented at an ASA meeting. What they did is they created a ileostomy. They flushed the colon anterogradually with electrolyte solution, drained intraabdominally, and in the in the postoperative course, they treated the patient with uh, intravenous metronidazole and daily vancomycin flushes through the ostomy. They included 42 patients in the study, compared them to a match cohort of another 42 patients, which they treated with colectomy. And what they found is a reduced mortality in their uh, experimental group of 19% versus 15%. But we have to say that there is no RCT which compares the different surgical treatment options in Clostridium difficile. So there is always a bit of a debate. Another interesting finding is uh, the high rate of CDI infection in stoma reversal surgery. There is a retrospective study done by some colleagues from Washington and I showed here the table of the results section and for better visibility I highlighted the rates of CDI infection after stoma reversal surgery which was 3.04% compared to the one of the elective colectomy group which was 1.25%. The reasons for this are not clear yet. There is some research ongoing They state that patients with an ostomy can have an altered or an other microbiome which favors uh, Clostridium difficile. And of course, patients with ileostomy are hospitalized, which is also a risk factor, as we saw before. So now I want to get you a bit more involved in this presentation. So I prepared a case presentation. There is a 46-year-old male admitted for high output ostomy of around 1,500 milliliter within 24 hours. He has further diffuse abdominal pain, which worsened in the last two weeks, and he lost around six kilograms of body weight. In the personal history, the, the patient had a long-standing Crohn's disease for which he had undergone laparotomy and, and resection for stricture and the formation of ileostomy several weeks ago. Lab test came back with a CRP of 75, um, a leukocyte count of 40,000 and a creatinine of 150. The clinical examination revealed a diffuse abdominal pain on palpation without sign of peritonism. So what diagnostic approach would you use? I would take uh, stool samples. Yes, and before, maybe? The, the patient was had surgery several weeks ago, so I would take a CT scan to exclude some complications like intraabdominal fluid collection or something else, but stool sample is a good idea. They came back negative for parasites and bacteria. But as you remember today's lecture, you also ordered a CDH and immunoassay, which are both positive. And something else we have to watch out for in this patient before we start the treatment. Maybe we should do an endoscopy to rule out the active Crohn's disease. Yes, exactly. And endoscopic, the endoscopy didn't show any active Crohn's disease. So, what treatment would you choose? A, B, C, or D? I would say he needs antibiotics with vancomycin and rehydration. Yes. Since we didn't hear that he had an other clostridium infection before, we will start with vancomycin and rehydration. 
But why did I brought up this um, this case, which is in fact the published case report? I didn't made up that from Klimko et al. I brought it up because usually Clostridium infection does only affect colon. However, there's emerging evidence that it can also affect the small bowel and other intestine. Also here, the, um, they stated in the literature, the reason for that is not known. There need to be done more research to find that out. But yes. Thank you. If this is a patient who's had a resection for Crohn's disease just several weeks ago for ileocecal Crohn's disease, which is most likely from your presentation, then he's did not have, um, he was not bowel prepped before surgery, which is the routine for these cases. So therefore he's not prepped for a colonoscopy. If just a few weeks post-operative, he goes into this sort of problem, you are not able to do a colonoscopy because you are not, you have not prepped this patient. So if this patient goes on to have um, C. diff colitis and you go on to do a colonoscopy in a non-prepped patient, that is a very risky thing to do. So in my opinion, uh, the endoscopy is something that you should not um, do in this patient unless there is a specific indication um, where you would need that. But otherwise, that would be contraindicated. Thank you for that. And what they also stated in this um, in this presentation literature that you have to rule out Clostridium difficile in patients with high output ostromies. That's my main message of this case, case report. So, as important as the treatment is the prevention of Clostridium difficile infection. Recommendations are minimize of antibiotic use, only use antibiotic when clearly indicated. Patients with a confirmed CDI have to be isolated and avoid unnecessary PPI use as they have a 2.5 times higher risk for development of CDI. And of course, hand disinfection is very important. So what I want you to memorize of this talk is Clostridium difficile is the primary cause of uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Three or more loose stools within 24 hours should alert. It is one of the few reasons for vancomycin to be applied orally. And if resection has to be done, a total colectomy is recommended and no segmental resection. Consider Clostridium difficile infection in high output ostomy patients and isolate the effect, affected patient. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian, for this comprehensive introduction. The stage is open for discussion. I know it's a little annoying, this topic, also for us, but still it's a major problem, also in terms of isolation. And what he didn't mention, but what you should do is also think of the isolation. So please do a contact isolation. If the patient is continent, cooperative, and mentally in a stage where he can follow you, you can also do angepasta contact isolation, which is better for the bed management. Any questions to Fabian or me? Two questions. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that vancomycin needs to be done given orally, right? Doesn't work intravenously. Reason is it has to be in the gut to kill the bacteria. Second question, if you do vancomycin and you have, we also have in the hospital VRE, uh, do these two infections, are they associated? And in, in terms of an active VRE and Clostridium and difficile infection, how you treat this? A very good question. So the first one, it is mainly orally or rectally. Um, both are possible. You can also give it rectally, especially if you know peristaltic is not going um, anymore, which you know better than I do. For the VRE, um, this is a problem indeed because it's selection pressure. But with us, we never had an association between C. diff and VRE outbreaks so far. Um, we don't have that many. Um, C. diff cases, especially in the last uh, months, we didn't have that many, but there was certainly, as far as we can tell, no correlation between that.
The treatment still usually C. diff is the major problem, so you go ahead. You can choose fidoxomycin, which makes less selection pressure on enterococci. The other way is change to an enterococcus active regimen without, um, you know, selection pressure or at least not very much demonstrated selection pressure, such as daptomycin, which, you know, has other problems, but this certainly works in those cases very well. Yeah. And the metronidazole, if I might add, I know this is against all the international guidelines, against um, ESCMIT guidelines, against IDSA guidelines. I have to say here, we don't have that many um, severe cases as far as we overview Switzerland, that's why we haven't changed it, but it might come that we will remove the metronidazole as a first-line treatment in the next years. Um, it's not planned, but it will probably change and be adapted to international guidelines. If I may just uh, also another question, what's the kind of like point on evidence on starting treatment before you have actually the definitive diagnosis? We were just faced this weekend again um, on the ICU, a gastroenterological patient, CRP 500, procalcitonin in 50. Um, he hasn't passed stool. So I also want to say, I think sometimes the stool, like the diarrhea is not a very good sign. And um, so he was quite sick. And um, I think we discussed there also with the ICU people to actually start vancomycin um, orally before we had the diagnosis, which was confirmed in his case of I mean, probably not very um, good from an infectiological point of view to start a treatment before we have a diagnosis, but how should we? Yes, I mean, no one else is here besides me, so it's okay. No, um, <clears throat> it is true in certain cases, especially with diagnostics that can take a long time here. Um, I think in those cases, severely ill patients, um, you know, diagnostics is difficult anyway because maybe megacolon or no passage, I think it's feasible to start um, the treatment because early treatment is usually better than late treatment also in C. diff colitis. So I think it's totally reasonable to do that in cases where people are really critically ill. On the ward, if someone has loose stool, doesn't have, you know, too much of inflammation or dehydration, I think you wait. But in such cases, as you described, it's totally um, appropriate to start. I just have uh, two comments to make. Uh, nice talk. Thank you very much. First of all, you said that one third of patients with uh, C. diff colitis will undergo surgery. I think that number is way too high. That must have been one third of patients probably with severe um, C. diff colitis. Otherwise. Yes, and certainly not in our patient population. The North American ones, they have this ribotype 027, which is much more aggressive. So their rate is higher, but certainly not in Switzerland. Yes, you're correct. And the second point is, um, you said, you mentioned that a high output ostomy should lead to the suspicion of a diagnosis of C. difficile colitis. And I think one must consider what type of ostomy we have. We see a lot of high output ileostomies, but that typically has nothing to do with C. diff colitis. So um, we're speaking about colostomies, a high output colostomy in a patient that is um, uh, on inpatient treatment that triggers the suspicion of C. diff colitis, but not a high output ileostomy. You're right. The ileostomy cases are really rare. They exist. Um, this is a dogma that was thrown over some years ago that you have infection also despite the tropism for the colon that C. diff toxins have. But there are cases of the small intestine, yes. But it's certainly not the, the classical presentation. Thank you very much.